Hi, and welcome to a special edition of Architect Tomorrow, here from Green IO, which is part of API Days London in September. This episode is going to be a bit of a showcase of some of the highlights of Green IO. It's been going on in the conference room behind me, totally packed, standing room only, some fantastic speakers from uh, some of the names in sustainable software, sustainable technology. We've been covering everything from data centers, cloud, AI, uh, green coding. Um, uh, yeah, kind of thinking holistically about the whole piece. I'm excited to be here this week because my team has also just launched the Tech Carbon Estimator. So for those of you that have been seeing what Scott Logic has been doing, we have be built a Tech Carbon Standard, a proposed way, a framework of classifying technology's impacts, specifically when it comes to carbon emissions right now. We'd like to expand it into more areas. But what we just launched this week is the Estimator tool which essentially helps you answer, after answering a few simple questions as an organization, it helps you understand what your uh, footprint is uh, with, yeah, with, a few, with a few clicks. Gives you an, an idea at a high level, it's not a detailed analysis, it just gives you a rough map of where in your technology estate uh, the emissions sit. So that's one of the things I've been talking to people about today. Uh, but it's, it's been fantastic to sort of speak to various different green technologists, sustainable technologists, thinking about where they can reduce the impact that technology has and where can technology play a role in, you know, in helping their organization to become more sustainable. Um, so look, hopefully you'll enjoy this episode. Gail and I are going to talk about you know, uh, bits of the day. I'm also going to be interviewing some of the speakers. So yeah, hopefully this is interesting. If you couldn't get to go and you wanted to, this perhaps gives you a bit of a, a highlights uh, opportunity to catch some of the best bits from the conference. Are they best bits? Possibly just the stuff that I've managed to capture. So sorry about that. Uh, for those of you that I didn't manage to capture on, on, on a conversation today. So my name is Ben Schwartz. I'm based in Paris. I'm French, but also British. And I've been working with the Greening and Streaming uh, very actively for two years and a bit before that. Um, and I was here basically to update people on where we are with trying to understand the issues of uh, streaming's environmental footprint. There are numbers out there, but it's probably at least 1% of global primary energy is used so that people can watch video streams. And there's a lot of, I suppose, debate, isn't there, about the impacts that networking has and whether you can really measure networking by the amount of data that's transferred. And you touched yeah. on some of that in your talk, didn't you? Yeah, so, so we've spent a lot of time debunking a kind of myth that there is a direct linear relationship between data and energy or data and carbon. Obviously, there's a relationship. You know, if nobody used data, then we wouldn't need networks, and there'd be less time. But it, it, it's just like if you decide to take you on your own, decide to take the bus or not take the bus, doesn't really make much difference to the bus. Right. Uh, right. So uh, and the you same thing about if you attribution versus consequential. That's so, right. Yeah, you can apportion. You can take a portion of that emissions and claim it's a saving, but actually the consequence hasn't changed. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's a complicated thing. I don't want to throw people without wanting too many puns on this under the bus. <laughs> but uh, the idea being, people that saying I'm not taking the bus because that's good, or I'm not taking the plane. If two people don't take one jet. The jet's not going to not go, yeah. so, but you still want to encourage people not to take the plane. So you've got to be careful uh, not to, but the, the reason we're talking a lot about that is we have noticed a lot of greenwashing in the industry where an organization say, I use so many thousands of terabits or whatever per year, I've cut that by 20%, therefore I've cut my, my, my carbon footprint by 20%. That's where we call foul, we say no, there's no evidence that that's the case. And so if people want to find out more, where can they go then? So there's a website, Greening of Streaming, all in one word, dot org. And uh, obviously the info, the email info at greeningofstreaming.org. And um, yeah, reach out to us. We're a very open organization. Obviously, if you join as members, you get all the benefits, but we do loads of things with non-members. We have projects open to non-members called the Lesser Poor Project. And we have volunteers join the organization. So uh, yeah, reach out if it's an open subject for you. Brilliant. Thanks very much for your time, Ben. This is how DIMPEC works. Um, the tool is mapped to the media workflow. So I said there are a bunch of other models that, that's part of DIMPEC as well. Streaming is one of them. So Netflix, for example, used this, this model as well. Uh, so we felt like we were in quite good company when we started using it. What really helped us is that that model was mapped to the digital publishing workflow. So we knew where we needed to go in the company to go and collect the data we needed. Now, pulling up um, this uh, diagram here, I'm sure the majority of us in this room are familiar. This is how we calculate digital emissions for a website um, or a, a digital application. Cloud hosting, 
content uh, delivery network, and end user emissions. For us, each of these hold their own challenges because we are a global business. Obviously, um, <laughs> the challenge around data centers is pretty, pretty well known. I'm not going to go into that in detail because that's been discussed. Um, but we have the same problem, especially around the fact that uh, the emissions that we get from them are market-based, not location-based. Again, if we're looking at this from a scientific perspective, we cannot use those numbers. Network infrastructure is a very interesting one. Recent research has come out saying, uh, confirming that uh, data transfer is pretty consistent throughout the day and it doesn't make that big an in, uh, impact on your emissions uh, if your uh, data transfer goes up or down. However, it's consistent in a specific country. We do business all over the world. 90% of our customers sit outside of the global north. They sit in South America, South Africa, India. Those countries don't have stable internet networks. And I'm going to touch on this in a little bit, but this is where equity around digital sustainability comes in as well. I'm James Martin. I'm Head of Content and Sustainability Communications for Scaleway. Scaleway is a French cloud provider uh, and we are part of the Iliad group, which is a big telecoms group. Okay. And um, what was the main uh, thrust of your conference uh, talk today? So I was talking about um, how to reduce your cloud impact from bare metal to AI, saying that you need to really look, um, you can't just say, uh, I've chosen a power efficient data center and that's enough. No, you yep. need to look at water consumption, you need to look at um, hardware. Hardware is three quarters of digital emissions, so what are you doing to make that hardware last longer? And you need to look at how you're optimizing your software so that it consumes as little energy as possible. And, um, and I wrap that up with a quick focus on uh, AI, which is a very important topic for us at Scaleway. Yep. Um, uh, sim similarly, you need to understand green IT properly to be able to limit the impact of AI. It's, it's the same principles that apply. And if I'm remembering correctly, and obviously there's been a few talks now, so I might be getting things modeled up, you were talking about PUE and water user, so power usage effectiveness and water usage effectiveness, yes. didn't you? I mean, so there's some interesting numbers that we may well cut to uh, after this, because oh, that was quite insightful. Is, is that, has that been quite eye-opening, like looking at some of the efficiency like of, of like cloud versus sort of on-prem hosting? What, what's that kind of journey look like for Scaleway? Um, Scaleway has always been, um, we, we've been talking for years about water okay. now. So. Yeah. Um, Everyone in, in the cloud business talks about PUE. Yep. Um, all the hyperscalers have very low PUEs, like 1.1 sort of, sort of range. Our best is 1.16. Um, but our point is that it's not, it's not just important to have a, if you have a low PUE, that's great. But if you're using oceans, and I mean, Literally, there's quantities of water that I, I can't get my head around. It's mind boggling, around. isn't it? The amounts. That are being used by some of the biggest uh, cloud providers. Yeah. It's, um, it's, like, it's like the mountain, it, it's like the, I, oh, I can't think of the English expression, but it's like you're hide, trying to hide a mountain with a mole, molehill right, sort right, of thing. Right, right. Um, because you're, yeah, you're doing really well on, efficiency, on, power, on power efficiency. But you are, you, you, we hear more and more stories of data centers depriving local populations of drinking water. And, and farmers that, of, of, of uh, irrigation for crops. That shouldn't happen. Yeah. It can't happen at scale where our, data, our French data centers do not use cooling towers. Cooling towers okay. are what, what use all this water, yeah. generally speaking. Yeah. Cooling towers are not allowed in France, but that, and that's one of the reasons we've innovated to come up with new new cooling systems that use a lot less water and energy. And so um, my podcast is all about architect tomorrow, so thinking about you know, where, where the future of technology is going. Looking forward to the, the future, are you optimistic or are you concerned about the current path that technology has when it comes to sustainability? Um, I'm concerned that uh, some of the biggest actors in tech are not um, having, are not 
properly being held accountable for the impact that they have. Right. I'm optimistic about trends like um, open source AI, okay. um, which are which are providing some ways to to reassure uh, that. So we're faced with a lot of opacity from some yeah. of the biggest players, yeah. but we know that there are alternatives available like take open source AI, um, it's open for all to see, so it's transparent, so it's measurable, it's often way more efficient than, um, than, uh, than the bigger models. models. Yeah. So, um, and that's, yeah, so if it's, if it's open, if it's transparent, it's measurable, and also if it can be used for more and more specific use cases instead of trying something, needing to be something that gobbles up the entire internet, uh, to, to be able to function, um, we're also seeing a trend towards more and more specialised AI models, and I think that's a that's a positive trend if they can be if they can be monitored, and if developers also, let's be honest, if developers need to be more incentivised yeah. to create smaller models, to write simpler code, to um, find ways themselves. That their, that their work can have less impact. It's that constant battle though, isn't it, between time to market pressures and profitability and, and getting things out there and building efficient software. Well, look, uh, James, it's been a great chat. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the day and thanks again for talking to me. Thanks a lot. In terms of carbon footprint, these numbers are thrown around a lot and it's very abstract. I've got a couple of things up there already. So for example, the carbon footprint of a banana is about 110 grams, taking a round trip to Hong Kong from London, economy class by the way, it's about 3.5 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. And we've also got the entire yearly emissions of UK as well. How about a Google search? What do you think is the carbon? Just throw some numbers out, I want to hear it. Five grams, great guess. Anyone else? 20 grams. 20 grams, nice guess. Less than one. Oh, Chris, I feel like <laughs> 0 0.5. Oh, that's, that's too good. <laughs> but yes, and I know with AI and everything, these numbers are map can be really big, but for a Google search, it's 0 0.5 grams. Okay, personal computer, any guess in terms of how much carbon that is? Usage. Everything, usage. Yeah. 100 kilos. Oh, very good guess. 100 kilos. 150. According to the book, it's 326 for a 13 inch MacBook Pro, so presumably everything. Yeah. Okay, back to cloud, cloud and data centers. Numbers, 2020. Well, well. Yeah, well, well. Well, Definitely over 1,000, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'll put you on your misery. <laughs> it was 160 million tons. And obviously, that's 2020. It's massively bigger now. And also, you know, there's other things as well. I mean, ICT sector, I'm, I'm coming to it. Also, we, we've seen blockchain, Bitcoin, things like that thrown in as well. So just to bring it, just Bitcoin alone. In 2019, this is. I have an old copy of the book, so please excuse the old data. And um, it was 46. And the last one is the entire ICT sector. So this is everything, networking devices, data centers, everything. And that's 1.4 billion tons of carbon dioxide. And the reason why I bring this to light, when I first read this book, it honestly had a really profound effect on me. More on a personal level, because it made me realize I could cut out me, I can cycle, I can do this. But one long haul flight could essentially dwarf everything. And I think that bigger context is so critical in the business world as well. Because while we focus on green software, it might be great if we don't think about the wider embodied carbon of that device and if you're replacing it every year, you could completely undo the good work you're doing on the green software side. So I think that's really important. And also the industry perspective. For some companies, it absolutely makes sense to look at green tech and green code because a lot of your emissions come from there. But for others, it might be a slightly different conversation because of their fundamental business model. 
I'm, I'm Mark Butcher, I'm the founder of a, a services company called Positive, and we do everything to do with digital sustainability. It doesn't matter whether it's cloud, data centers, end user, we're involved in it. And uh, just give us a bit of a flavor of the talk that you gave today at Green IO. A bit of a harsh reality check, um, coming from the, really from the trenches about the cloud, what it really means for sustainability, and some realities around reporting and the challenges that come with it. And I was really pleased to see you talking again about one of the AWS uh, reports that we've sort of talked about on LinkedIn, um, the up to 99%. I mean, can yeah. you, can you, that's a really, really important point, I think, for people to understand is that what's being said by vendors isn't always the reality. Yeah, that, that report is the one that I think has triggered me quite a lot because they, they've said that moving your AI services from on-premise to the cloud will save you up to 99%. Broadly speaking, that's nonsense. It won't. The truth is it depends upon where you are, how you're building it, what you're running on before, and how you'll build it in the cloud. It won't be up to 99%. It could be better, but it equally could be up to five times worse. It's nuanced, isn't it? And it's yes. the contextual and this kind of blanket statements that things are more sustainable by moving to the cloud isn't helpful. Yeah, and I think that was the one thing I wanted people to take away from my talk was challenge everyone. Yeah. Well, look, thanks, Mark. It's great to see you again. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's great to have you as part of the Green IO community. Well, thank you. It's been great. Whole impacts of technology, and we all agree that there are a lot of positive impacts, right? So, from the environmental perspective, um, let's be honest, without the big data, probably we would not have really understood uh, the impact or the magnitude of climate change. So, that really helped us to understand the models, it really helped us to advance in the scenarios. There's a good surveillance as well <laughs> um, in the environmental perspective, you know, there's the whole uh, question about poaching, for example, how to tackle that. In the social side, I did put count videos because apparently recently I found out that for some people it really helps to tackle the social anxiety and to tackle that. So apparently that does have a big uh, or can have some really good positive impact. But uh, what to use the metaphor of medicine, right? When we take medication, if we take it at the right time, under the right conditions, and to tackle the right kind of problem, <coughs> that medication is really helpful. Most of the time, it often comes with some reflect, you know, saying adverse effects and potential risk hazards. Um, but if we do not respect that, it does pose risks, right? So it's the same with technology, actually. If we do apply it in the right time, under the right conditions, for the right reasons, it can come and bring a lot of benefits. And if you do not respect, well, it's, it's kind of similar. So that's a metaphor which I like to use when I talk about digital technology and solutions. And what's in common when we talk about different effects? It's actually us. Um, every day and today what we were talking you know, is we make decisions. We decide what type of equipment we want to buy, what type of smartphone, um, which we want to invest, you know, if we are in the company, who do we want to work with, um, how we want to design some software, what type of code, language we want to use. So that's all about the decisions. We want to make them or not, but we do have to make them. Um, in my academic field, we call that decision makers. So that's the term which I'm going to use it. Um, going forward, and the question is how to make the decisions in the VUCA world, right? So the VUCA is another buzzword which currently is being used very often in volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world, right? But we do live in this world, and um, this is a quote from Steve Jobs in 2008. So, yeah, it's a, it was a time when he said, you know, that technology is kind of like waves, we can see that coming from far away and then we can take that as surf in it. Um, that was in 2008. <clears throat> I would say that currently that sea became very uh, difficult to surf on and uh, I am a surfer, right? It's not, it's not very easy to navigate when there are a lot of waves, they're crashing over, all over, the, the weather is not clear, what's going on, and I believe that's the world we are facing today. Alex, hi. It's great to have you here at Green IO conference today. Um, for those that don't know who you are, can you perhaps briefly introduce yourself and then I'll talk to you about what you've been talking about at the conference today. I'm a web developer, sustainability researcher, co-chair of the Sustainable Web Community Group, 
and the editor of the Web Sustainability Guidelines. That's the W3C uh, group, right? Yeah, it's a community group at W3C. Brilliant. And so give uh, everyone a, a flavour of what you were talking about today at Green.io. I was introducing people to our community group and what our activities have been, which is creating the Web Sustainability Guidelines. And where can people find the Web Sustainability Guidelines? They can find it on our GitHub repository, on our community group page. It's available via Googling for Susty Web at the moment. Susty Web, okay, great. And how have you found today? Has there been anything particularly insightful, interesting that's, that you've learnt from the other speakers today? Yeah, there's been a lot of interesting talk in terms of the DevOps side because obviously, especially talking about things like water usage, which there's not a lot of information about on the sort of open at the moment, but people talking about how more data is being collected currently, it's encouraging. Yeah, it's certainly interesting to hear people talking about water usage as well as power usage and carbon and so on and so forth, isn't it? Well, look, Alex, thanks very much for talking to me. Thanks for being part of today. Maybe, shall we keep on talking about AI? Does it make sense? Because there is a bit of a trade-off, like, shall we use the buzzword? Because obviously it would attract attention, and that's a, a word that you can use discussing with non-tech people, but we also know that the more deep dive, the more that AI doesn't seem to have like a very clear boundaries or even definition. So I would love to have your, your definition, your thought on shall we use the word AI, and then of course we will discuss sustainability, but we've got some academics in the room and they love when things are well defined at the beginning. I think the, the thing with tech buzzwords is that yes, they draw in a lot of people, the other thing with tech buzz things in general is that if we in the sustainability space don't talk about those things, nobody's going to talk about those things from the sustainability angle. So talking about it means that we can bring in some sense of sustainability into the topic um, that would otherwise maybe be lacking. And um, so yes, I think we should talk about AI. Uh, well, I, I'm just going to say that I could not agree more uh, with Sandra, uh, that uh, AI is something that everybody's talking about, so we need to talk about it. And if we don't talk about it, we don't define it as. Uh, there are ways of doing it that are green. There are ways that, are, uh, and there are ways that are doing it of doing it that are not. It is fundamentally just the same kind of issues, the same kind of ways of working that, that we need to adopt for all of technology. Uh, and AI just gives us time and, and some, some attention to talk about it. So it would be crazy not to take advantage of it. It is a, a crisis that we're failing to take advantage of if we don't talk about it. And if we don't use the words that everybody else is using. So I would totally agree with Sandra. What are the main pitfalls that you experience yourself when discussing the topic of AI being or not being sustainable? So it's not a yes or no answers, but what are the pitfalls when you're discussing this people topic? Uh, I would say the main pitfall is, is the pitfall that everybody falls into whenever you're talking about green tech, green software, green operations, which is that people think that it will be too hard to do it. It's like so hard to do it that they won't even start. So uh, yeah, it's like, oh, well, you know, we need to do AI, and there's no way we can do AI that's green. And we've got to do AI, so we won't even try to do AI to hit the screen. That is the, the, the issue, is that people give up before they even start. Because, it's, because there's so much discussion about all oh, AI is, is naturally ungreen, and, and you have to make a decision between sustainable and AI, and everybody goes, well, I will lose my job if I don't do anything with AI, therefore I'll just ignore all the green, the green side of it. The big risk is that people don't even take these simple and first steps because they think it's impossible, and it really isn't. It's, it's all about trying to go to something which is perfect, perfect green AI, and, and giving up on the fact that actually AI move where you're doing your um, model creation, move where you're doing your training, move where you're doing your inference, so in time and space, it's all doable. Uh, don't give up. So Chris. It's been a pretty full-on day, hasn't it, of insightful talks from, from lots of different speakers. And you, that feels like a long time ago, you kicked off the, the, the day with your keynote. 
What was the um, core kind of messages of, of, of the keynote from this morning? I think the key messages I was trying to get across were A, there are changes in the law that we can take advantage if we actually want to be more of an effective movement. Also, the, a lot of the ideas that we take for granted as kind of like techie, webby people are actually quite different to how people s make laws and make standards and things like that. And quick, I think that, collaboration on Yeah, that. yeah. This is yeah. one thing I think is actually really, really useful and something we should double down on, right. especially given that there are relatively few of us and we're geographically distributed. I think that's actually another thing. And uh, the other one was, I thought that there's a lot to, there's a really good argument for in many ways, seeing where the projects that we're working on are complementary to each other. Okay. So the, again, we're able to increase the kind of reach that we might otherwise have, or see where there's, what's the word I'm after? Helpful differences on projects, basically. Okay, okay. another connectivity between those things. Yes. I mean, uh, yeah, I'm really passionate about that with the work we're doing in open source work. I think, as you know, the Tech Carbon Standard is all about providing a bit of a reference to then navigate to different standards and different projects. And um, I also really love the piece of work you put out recently with Hannah on the um, impacts of AI. Fantastic yes, piece of work. Thank you. Um, if people want to see that, where do, where do they go? If they look up uh, the Green Web Foundation, uh, and the fastest way is literally Green Web Foundation publications. You put, okay. put that into a search engine, yep. you'll find it there. Yep. Uh, we don't have a snappy URL to share, right. and I don't have a QR right. code. Right. But that's the thing I would suggest. It's the environmental impact. It's the report on the env direct environmental impacts of AI. We don't focus on uh, the use, like the, the wider impacts yeah. of it, but if you want to understand the environmental impacts and, you're, and you are responsible for a project, it's designed as a kind of guide so that you've got at least some context and know where it might go and what some of the immediate things you might try to do would be. And you know what, Chris, um, we skipped over sort of your, your quick intro, but what was fascinating for me today is to learn you used to work for Amy. Because yeah. I used to work for AEA, uh, that may, they may not make it uh, really bells, but AEA helped the government come up with the emissions uh, conversion factors yeah. that Amy used. Yeah. So it's quite amusing. I, I kind of like really admired what Amy were doing back in the day in, in the sort of 2010, uh, yeah. uh, 2008 sort of era. So it's fascinating to hear that you were also involved in, in that yeah. work in those days. There's a few of us around. Right. You, they, they show up. They, they, they turn up in different places. So, yeah, that's yeah. a start that casts quite an interesting shadow. Yeah, but just to kind of let everyone know who you are, who they know. But what, what are your kind of main roles that you're, you're, you're doing? I know you wear multiple hats. Yes, um, I work as uh, one of the directors of the Green Web Foundation. Uh, I also am one of the organisers of ClimateAction.Tech, which is an online community which a lot of people who do things in digital sustainability end up kind of coordinating and organizing on. And uh, through the Green Web Foundation, we are one of the founding members of the Green Software Foundation, which is a larger industry body. And I'm involved in A, the podcast there, where I get people to explain things on the cutting edge of this field Massive to me that, and by extension everyone else. Yeah. And also I am one of the chairs on the policy working group, where we basically try to change some of the see how to take advantage of changes in the law to like further the ideas around like green software and more sustainable digital services. Thanks Chris, it's been great to catch up with you. Cheers. And uh, yeah, it's been a good day, hasn't it? Likewise, yeah. yeah. Lovely to see you in person as well. <laughs> yeah. Great, thanks. Gail, been a brilliant day here at Green IO Conference as part of API Days London. Yeah, um, loads of amazing talks. What's been your kind of big highlights for, for today? Uh, I would say the energy. Okay. The, the energy, green energy. Oh, sorry, that's a bad one. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say uh, the energy, both from the attendees. I mean, last year, it was not a green IO conference per se, but it was a, lot of, a, a, few, a handful of very dedicated people, but you could feel that the room was like half empty. Yep. And today we literally have had to, we had to refuse people. I mean, right. there were no room seats. Only at yeah, times. yeah. yeah it, which is a good sign. Actually, right? it actually. <laughs> You did it all the day, so uh, uh, thank you a lot for this. And uh, but also the energy from the speakers, I, I could feel that they, they were energized by the fact that well, we've, we've got an audience, we've got something being built up, yeah. and you know this energy is actually already getting translated uh, in in connection. In Green IO is all about connecting people. You know, it's very simple. It's a global problem. We need everyone to stay connected not to do twice the same job and to understand that most of the problem that I face, the others already have faced it. So uh, let, let's share experience, let, let's network and let's make sure that we get the latest insight.
And I suspect most people watching or listening to this probably haven't been lucky enough to come along. Yeah. So if they're interested in the presentations or other content, where, where can they go to find that? I'm going to ask each speaker if he or she is fine to share the content, but I'm quite confident that like 90% of them will agree to put their presentation uh, live. Yeah. Brilliant. Excellent. Yeah. Oh, not live, sorry. Yeah. Like, on, the green IO. <coughs> yeah, on, on the Green IO. On the Green IO.tech website, yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, look, thanks, Gail. Thanks, lot. thanks a lot for volunteering. Yeah, um, no worries. Yeah, that, that was really, really cool, and I'm looking forward to the nicer uh, uh, Architect Tomorrow uh, episode. You are. In, 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 Hopefully in, it comes in, out okay. <laughs> right. It'll be interesting. Right, kind of, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's been great. It's good to collaborate. Thanks, Gail. Thank you so much. Cheers.